like to welcome everyone to EOF implementers call number 50. Uh, um, got a regular meeting schedule, got client updates, compiler updates, spec updates, testing updates, and other items. Um, if anyone else wants anything added to the agenda that's not on the agenda, please mention it in chat so I can see it um, so we can get to it at the appropriate time. <clears throat> First, we'll start with uh, client updates. Uh, Ahmed, uh, can you have any update for Nethermind? Um, yes, not sure if Ayman is here, maybe not, but he's currently, we started again working on uh, refining our implementation and uh, mostly uh, the AIP related to uh, the uh, creation and uh, if that's done i think we will be mostly aligned with what we what the uh, what the spec is and possibly even join a devnet uh once that is done yes okay cool i'm gonna go ahead devnet's a good thing let's talk about that app and other items um Let's see, Bob, are you with the client team or are you just listening? If you're with the client team, speak up. Otherwise, I will move on to, uh, I guess, base, alphabetically a first name, that would be Basu. Um, I just merged the um, last, the, we had issues with being equivalent with um, the gas costing because um, I basically needed to rewrite our gas costing for EXT call. So um, I merged that and now Besu and EVM1 create identical traces when you filter them out to their um, gas costs and most of the other critical items for the trace. Um, I'm about to merge it into main, into, into Ethereum main. Um, it's going to activate on a fork named prog EOF for mainnet, uh, not for mainnet, for like Genesis files, but for reference tests, it still activates on the prog name. So that's uh, what we're going to go forward unless we, um, until we had at least DevNet too uh, in Pectra. Um, let's see. Next on the list would be Dragon Ref updates. Yeah. Uh, uh, I ran the, the test suite that we had and I didn't have Prague updated there. So I had some few, a few tests failing that I fixed. I still have tests related to UF create that we need to fix. That's mostly on the red side. Uh, on we are adding support for the inside the foundry because if the REVM is yeah supporting UF, it can be easily included with the new Solidity compiler. So after the problems with UF UF create uh, are addressed inside the REVM, it's probably going to be just yeah, it's going to pass inside foundry. It can be used. Cool. That's mostly it. Yeah. Cool. Um, EVM one. Uh, not many updates from EVM one side. Uh, I think uh, there was to merge this uh, tweak that we disallowed truncated data in top level containers, but that mostly affects testing. And I don't see anything else here. We have still the init code mode validation. Uh, change uh, in review in progress, and that's it. I think unless Pavel cool. can want to add something. No, I I, I don't remember anything else. Yeah. Cool. Um, do we have anyone from Geth on the call? Um. Anyone from Aragon? Ethereum JS? Okay. Um, any other clients I didn't name? Cool. Um, next item is compiler updates. Uh, Charles, anything from Viper? No, sorry. I've been uh, really busy with the big release. Okay, that's fine. Um, do we have anyone from Solidity on the call? 
Okay. Um, the solidity proof of concept uh, got a few updates this last week. Um, so this is from um, Peter's writing this, or no, it's not Peter. Ravada. It's uh, Ravada, yeah. Um, yeah. The the big the big difference is um timing wise is also been added to some some of the information. Other than that, it's pretty much the same information as last week. Um, just we've got a better organization and answering more questions as they come up. Go ahead. Oh, Victor, are you muted? Okay. Um, so that's, that's uh, any other compiler updates before we go into spec updates? All right. So for spec updates, we got three items, um, two clarifications, a discussion on a NIT code, and also one that I forgot to put on the agenda that came up during testing. I mentioned in chat has to do with the address during EOF create. Um, it's probably just going to be a spec clarification. It's something you don't think about until you start getting devious tests written against your code. Um, so the first proposed change is requiring max init code uh, during validation. Um, Peter, you want to yep. lead the charge on that? Yeah, we have. I have you know, pitched this on the previous call, and uh, I think it's we got some uh, agreement that this is okay, but I just wanted to make sure that nobody has any objections before we merge this. So I think Pavel was uh, on board, and uh, you, Dana, as well, I think you have the voice. Yeah, I don't know. No, that was a different, a different one, but I don't know. Maybe you're um, okay with this. Then also Solidity said, we had, we had thoughts whether this limit would not impact Solidity testing, but it, uh, we confirmed that it would not. Um, and I think also this popped up in the recent Discord uh, discussion with Marius from that. Mm -hmm. And I think this uh, this PR link was was mentioned there, and he was like, "Okay with this." I, I think uh, no, I, I haven't heard any objections. If there are any, please let to know now. Otherwise, can we assume that this is a goal? Yeah, I mean, we'll have to hammer out the exact corner cases as we find them. But in general, one thing I would like is if we track max and knit code as the as the size, rather than a new constant or a doubling of max and knit code, um, because that's what's going to matter for the system. For testing, um, I think we just need to have a flag where we take it off, because as was mentioned on 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 the Discord, I think there's going to be valuable need for testing things like validation with absurdly large containers to ensure that we're really linear. For example, a container with uh, a thousand uh, full code sections that contain nothing but call offs to each other. Um, and that would be like 64 gigs, not 64 gigs, 64 megs. And when you make sure that, you know, validates within the appropriate um, gas schedule time. So that, that can be worked on later. What do you mean linear in size or in some other aspect? In so size, we, get, we get the gas that is charged when you create a contract. And we want to make sure that the time, you know, it grows per byte. So we want to make sure that the gas per second it would take to validate it doesn't slow the system down. So I guess we could say we want the time per byte to grow linearly rather than exponentially or parabolically. But that would be just like a one of tests, not right not and continuous integration. Exactly. Exactly. That would be a one off test. Yeah. Well, that can be accomplished with just tweaking the implementation, I guess. Yeah. So that's that's the only thing that would implement this max code size. But like like you mentioned, it's one off and doesn't need to be repeated regularly. Gotcha. Um oh Barnabas has an update for clients from Marius. Passing 231, 232 validation tests, have looked at state tests, haven't, can't make the call today. Okay, so we, we got updates. That's good numbers from Geth. Mm -hmm. um, Mario, you raised your hand. Yeah, so this uh, extra large UF test, uh, do we want? I, I don't think we want this in state tests, right? Because 
in state yeah. test, uh, it would mess a lot of a lot of things. Um, so do we want this on the on, on a neo F test uh, fixture? Is that is that the idea? So yeah, I think that would be the right place to put it. We well, I mean, we that would like make the test size really large. I almost wonder if we need to have a separate separate torture test that is not distributed as part of normal tests. Um, where we keep the torture tests, so we can just torture the implementations, um, maybe once or twice per fork, to, uh, to make sure these extreme. I mean, this is an extreme measure because we could keep all the 48k tests to make sure everyone's in time um, with just 48k things. But when we're going beyond the scope of the limitations, I don't know that we. Yeah, I mean, we want to make sure we we dismiss a uh, four megabyte test, but a 64 megabyte test. But do we want to put that in the test cases? Yeah. Another option could, could be that we can uh, request the client teams to add the, this as a unit test. Right. In each of right. their repos. The... That, that's another option because we can keep it out of the fixtures. It won't mess with the format, um, but they still get 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 some kind of feedback from, from this test. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, uh... we, uh, we can design it, design the test. And then just mm -hmm. distribute it to the to the teams and make sure that they are adding it to some unit test somewhere in their code. Okay. Yeah, we can design tests and have the Python spit out the test. That yeah, that we can do that. Okay. So yeah, so we just need to get this spec up. Where does this go? Thirty five forty. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. Like so the, the the general code validation goes. Uh, sorry, the general container validation goes into thirty five forty. Uh, so no. Yeah. yeah. Forty. Okay. Uh, this um, uh, did that has two sections. One has for general EOF, and the other is for general EOF v one. Is it so it's it's like an editorial decision whether where do we actually put it. Mm. I think EOF V1 is better, but it's just a matter of taste, I guess. Doesn't, doesn't impact a lot. There's no specs in 7692. Um, I don't know. Can you go back to where you... Maybe, maybe this mention which you were following was just coincidence I don't know I think it would go to it would go to 3540 this one yes because it has okay. container validation rules here oh just just oh there you go oh. AOF version one validation rules so these are sort of separate from code validation rules which are different to EIP and I would see that particular rule being added here okay cool all right, so we'll get that spec updated. Um, yep. Next is there's a minor update on our jumps and successors for um, the creation targets. Oh yeah, this is this is here. This, this is, is my spec item. I think. Yeah, so this one we're adding our jump v. No, our jump is uh, our jump. Okay, and I think everyone's tests had that already. Yeah. I think this was just clarification that Marius yeah. stumbled on. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So that's a good one. And the and next the one. Oh. Uh, right. Right. This is this is not contentious. Right. So um basically if you're in the middle of doing an EOF create either from a create transaction or an EOF create operation, and if you call out to a legacy contract and they call out to the address of the contract that is in process of being created. Um, it will come back as an empty account. Um, and I think that's just, you know, there's, we can't, it's not EOF until it's been validated. So we can't say it's EOF. And just like legacy, there's no code that exists. So we'll just do the existing code behavior for legacy that if you try and um, introspect the code mid-creation, you get nothing. 
and that for most implementations should be a no op, but it's worth encoding and it's writing in the spec. Okay. And so the last one. okay, so so the last one is uh, there's a lot of editorial change here, but the, the second bullet actually, there was a rule proposed on the OF call that we well uh, this allows sub containers referenced by both return contract and EOF create. Uh, yeah, the, the the diff is bigger because um, I'm also removing the definitions here, but that's like uh that's it separate. Um but last or the last line here. Uh I think this was should suggested by Andre, but he's not here today, I think. Um, yeah. And I don't think we have tests for the 298 line, and I'll write that up. So I'm fairly certain BASU allows unreferenced containers, and that it passes the test to me indicates we don't have a test. So we need it. I wasn't sure if this had made the spec yet, but now that it's in there, I'll definitely add it. Well, th th this, this PR doesn't add this line. It just changed the wording. This this PR adds the last line, 299. Yeah. And this is what okay. I, I don't know. We potentially need to discuss. Yeah. If you if you actually go follow the link, um, which is in the PR um, discussion in the description. <clears throat> yeah, here. This is the broader context. So would we ban reverted valid onlys or? Not really. Like uh, option one is banning revert invalids. OK, option, option two, two is would allow weaker. those, and you would still have to. OK, we yeah, just but... didn't enforce it yeah, at yeah. the calling level. You, you, cannot, yeah, you, can, you can have such a container, but you cannot reference it in both EOF read and return contract. OK. Which I think has practical um, benefits. I'm sure some genius will figure out a way to make a dex out of it or something. So we should probably leave it. OK. Anyone have commentary on this? Or should we go ahead and add it? All right. Uh, maybe um, I have, maybe I have like question for clarification. Mm -hmm. uh, this adds additional validation, basically validation on if the container contains only stop return return contract, or it does it, or it does contain only return contract. But I'm not exactly sure what we we want to check. So the way I implemented it in Basu, what I Recursive in the subcontainers. I put in a flag in a subcontainer for how I was referenced from the parent container, whether I was referenced via EOF create or return contract. And based on that, I have validation rules for stop return and return contract. And if I was referenced by EOF create and I see a stop or return, I raise a validation error. Similarly, if I was referenced by a return contract and I see a return contract in the container referenced by the parent, um, by that reference, then I do a validation error. So that's that's the uh, impact of this, is if you do a return contract or an UF create on a container that has one of these band operations for that type, then it's a validation error, and I detect it while I'm in the subcontainer. OK, that makes sense. OK, I still um, need to add that, but yeah, yeah, it makes sense to add those. Yeah, so we just need to add validation tests for that. Yeah. All right. Um, any other questions or concerns about this? All 
Okay. Our Spock updates are getting much shorter and they're going along the lines of this is what we've been doing. Let's validate it. So I think that's really good indication that we're actually closing in on zeroing in on finally being complete um, with the multiple implementations. So this is good. Um, testing updates. I don't know who wants to take the testing updates. Um, I guess I can start. Um, I've, I think I, most of the PRs are already merged. Um, there are some couple of outstanding ones, but please check if there are review comments that need to be sorted out. Uh, I think mostly most of the comments are regarding duplicated tests. So we have this uh, legacy containers.pi, which I created like more than a year ago. And I think it's like very convoluted. It's not worth to have this. So if you guys find uh, a test case that it's duplicated in this file, please just uh, take the take the opportunity to remove it in your PR. Um, so yeah, if you see this comment, just please please go ahead and just go into this file and re remove the, the the duplicated test cases. Um, um, but yeah, I think there's not much to it, but. That only that there's uh, PRs, uh, progress in PRs merged and uh, just implemented. Um, we made uh, two two releases, I think, UF for UF. Um, if you guys find any issues with the fixtures that are being produced, please just reach out. Uh, we can uh, we can fix them. Um, otherwise, yes. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. For for versioning, I think Dan is the one. Uh, let me see if he's he's here. Um, I see him. Is yeah. he close to his mute right. button? <laughs> Hello, everyone. Yeah, it's Dan here. Um, yeah, so in the R&D Discord, um, I've had a bit of uh, interaction with Piotr and Pavel about um, maybe trying out EIP versioning with um, with EOF. And um, so basically, uh, I mean, a TLDR is basically... Um, I've been working on an EIP to introduce um, versioning for EIPs um, that we're looking at right now. And uh, the proposal is still in draft status, um, but we could potentially like test and like take EOF as a pilot project for this and start versioning the EOF um, EIPs. And basically this could help us with the testing pipeline in order to uh, make sure that the test version and the client versions uh, are using the same version of the spec. Um, so if you're interested, um, I've been basically prototyping um, a very minimal um, version of it in the test framework. Uh, I don't, we, obviously we don't have it on the specs as in on the Ethereum AIPs side yet, and we don't have it on the binary side yet, uh, but I'm happy to start ramping this up if there's interest. Um, so I'm reading through this. Is the versioning now handled by tooling? And we have to put a major, minor, or patch in one of the commits and the tooling figures it out? So that would be uh, the end goal, yes. But I think we're quite a long way away from that. Um, I mean, if you have a look at the ETH Magicians thread, um, there's still quite a lot of discussion about whether we want to apply a semantic version at all. Um, and I think before uh, any development work gets done on tooling, this should go to all core devs and be discussed uh, in a broader scope before tooling for the IPs repository gets gets implemented. Um, but there's maybe a soft um, version what we could go for. Um, as I've understood um, from discussions with the EIP editors, if we moved this 7577 to um, review status, then we could introduce a change log section in the EIPs that want to use versioning. And as long as we um, add 7577 to the requires uh, preamble of the EIP that wants to use it. Uh, so we could exactly, we could start adding a section uh, as Dano is showing here. Um, and assuming it's ordered, which I'm sure it would be, um, we could make some tooling uh, to to pass the, the the first version list in the change log, change log and, and use that as a spec version. 
um, from the client side, what it needs is basically any binary that um, that touches testing. So anything that gives us a result like the transition tool or the EOF pass tool um, should ha get a new flag um, minus minus EOF minus versions that would give us a JSON um, with a lookup of uh, EIPs and their respective version that are implemented in that binary. Do we have a prototype of what that JSON file should be? It, there is a, <laughs> let me just see if I've got the link in my, um, there is a, this Discord discussion. Um, and I think uh, I did add a version at the top. Uh, I can add it somewhere else if it's a bit lost in Discord here. I think you'd have to scroll up to find the JSON version. Um, that's That's the post from today. Um, so something like this. Um, so I mean, this is this is one of the big questions about the proposal is whether um, that's an acceptable amount of work for client teams to maintain in their implementations. But basically, every binary that implements an EIP would have, would, in order for this to be useful, would have to um, provide uh, the testing framework with this output, so that we could then compare the the client implementation version with the testing version and with the version that we would pass from the change log in Ethereum EIPs. The tooling, so the tooling on the on the on the Ethereum EIP side, I mean I would hope that essentially the change log section could be written automatically from tooling based on the commit message. Um, and and the and the PR title, for example. Okay. But I think we're we're a long way off getting the tooling into the IPs, but we're quite close to having a a, sort of a, a soft version where we could add a change log and then start using it within the test framework. Okay. See what I can draft up this week. Um, I should I should let you know that I'm gonna be away um out of office for for like basically the next uh, two months. So if I mean I'm very happy to make a push today and tomorrow and Friday. Don't um, not today tomorrow Friday now. We can come back to this in two months. Okay. I mean, failing that, Mario said he'd be happy to pick up the work on the test framework side. And um, although I'll be away, I'll be following uh, progress on 7577. Okay. I would, um, I would still try to get things uh, ready on our side before I leave um, in the, to a state that Mario could take over. Cool. That sounds good. All right. Thanks. Any other test updates or anyone else have any commentary on testing status? So regarding the versioning, uh, you can do fix or feed or feed with an explanation mark in order to bump specific versions. If it's just a fix or a feature or a breaking change, which requires a major update. So this definitely could be automated by a commit. Okay. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's the basic idea, yeah. Cool, anyone else? One last topic on the agenda that was a late ad that I put in there. Um, so the last item that I put on, as I mentioned in chat, is the question of dev nets. Um, from what I recall from our all core devs um, last week, um, which is by the way, anyone not listening to all core devs, um, EOF is currently slated for prod. Um, that was less than a week ago, but it's uh, coming in Prague, but it's not targeted for the next test net one, DevNet one. 
Um, and uh, it may or may not be in DevNet 2, depending upon client readiness. Um, but what we could do before we um, join the formal DevNets is we could work together to set up our own internal DevNet. But the question, one of the questions there is how do we activate EOF? Do we activate EOF requiring DevNet 1 features? Do we set up the test net requiring Cancun in plus EOF, which might require some more configuration on some clients? Or do we just be patient and wait for DevNet 2 or DevNet 3 um, and just rely on most, most of our um, client testing to make sure that we're still compatible? Um, so uh, any thoughts, Barnabas? I would actually recommend to have an EOF specific fork activation and an EOF specific uh, like fork epoch where all the EOF clients can just fork completely outside of the scope of Prague at this point. So I would just build it on Cancun. I, I don't know if that's reasonable for all the client teams, but it would be the easiest to test by far without touching any other code base. Okay. So Cancun EIP 7692. Uh, from red side, it's a little bit easier to extend uh, Prague and just have another fork Prague plus EOF. That's the easier solution because we need we don't have like features. We have like level where the fork is enabled. We cannot pre basically disable previous fork. Could you not trigger mm -hmm. EOF at a different activation based on like an EOF time? where you say on this epoch time, you want to trigger EOF. And if we have prog set, uh, not, not prog, yeah, prog set to a, a date that is uh, well in advance, then prog will not be triggered, EOF would yeah. be. It, it could be done a little bit hackily, but uh, it's like if the prog indent format to get activated it means and even EOF is get activated we can add like code features that going to say disable that like build but yeah it can be done um how does nethermind approach forking did we lost nethermind no we haven't Ahmed He must be away from his pause button. Um, I know for Besu, we also have a similar issue with it that uh, Ref has. All of our forks um, are very combined together. It's every all everything or nothing. So in each fork, so it builds off of a previous fork. So um, I have written in Besu code to support both, but I basically had to write two different forks, a Cancun EOF 7269 and a Prague EOF fork. So um, that's the work it would take on base two is we just basically would need to make two separate forks, succeeding Cancun or succeeding Prague. And if we want to activate Prague, it's, it gets kind of kind of weird, but I was able to figure it out. We don't have, um, we don't support the feature get proposed years ago, which is fork plus a bunch of EIPs because we don't activate EIPs individually per se. Um, I wish we had Geth on so Geth could speak to their forking per process. Never mind does uh, activation per EIP. I know okay. that. So I'm not sure if they would do that for UF as well, but uh, previously that's what they done. And all of their Genesis file has to include uh, EIP specific activation time. Okay. Guess does it based on just a single whatever like prog time, mm -hmm. but I, I don't know if they did that for EOF yet. Um, I could try and pick apart uh, Marius's fork, but I don't know how easy it would be to swap between the two. Um, I mean, it got easier this last week when thirty seventy four got removed. So that did simplify it a bit. So there's no opcode level changes coming in right now before EOF. 
um, all of the changes all around the transaction processing and the withdrawals and stuff like that. Um, so it did get a little easier. I was able to factor it out. All the changes um, related to precompiles, BLS team. Oh, right. We added yeah. precompiles. That's the change. That's the big change. It's one line and one test that I always forget until the last moment. So yeah, that's makes sense. Yeah. Um, in general, from how I see it, there are not big overlap between EOF and the uh, Devnet zero. So in that, it, having that in mind, just extended Devnet one to just having EOF, basically doing Prague plus EOF seems reasonable to me. If people want to do it like more clearly, like separately, like uh, like having can plus UF, I'm I'll be fine with that. But we prefer more like Prag plus UF. Okay. And one advantage I see about Prag plus EOF is it requires Prag to be implemented before we can add on EOF. So all the other features for Prag need to be put in place before we can activate EOF, which would um help address the issue that EOF is stealing resources from the rest of Prag. If we have to get the rest of Prague done first, we can't steal resources. So that's true. Um, so it doesn't sound like we're going to come to consensus on this call. So I'd encourage all the teams to to think about it, um, talk about it maybe on the Discord chat group. Um, because DevNet one is going to take at least a month, and DevNet two is at least two months out. Is that a correct guess, Barnabas? Uh, we are just waiting for the consensus back to be merged. Uh, so that might be tomorrow. And then a week after that, we can probably la launch DevNet 1. So I would expect okay. maybe end of the month for DevNet 2, possibly. Oh, end of June before July. Wow. Moves quick. Uh, depends how many changes there will be and how stable it is. Yeah, but, and it depends if EOF makes DevNet yeah. 2 or not. So, okay. So it, it really depends, like, how do you guys want to trigger it? Because if we, can, if, if we could trigger EOF, all EOF features without touching any prog code, because prog code at this point is pretty much untested. So, like, it would be very good if you could just test EOF on its own without any other headache. Um, but it feels like uh, that's not reasonable from rest okay. and present. So, yeah, I think we need um we need to hear from Marius before we try and move towards a consensus direction or someone else on the Geth team for their implementation. Yeah, yeah I so I guess... Marius what their what his preference was for forking EOF. Okay, and we can proceed from that. Okay, if we can do that all async. Okay. So we'll move this async. Um, any other topics people want to discuss relating to EOF? I did post in the chat, but um, I think that we should visit the gas schedule uh, because uh, according to the Solidity POC article, there's like a somewhat large mismatch now, I think. Um, because jump test analysis is already like, uh, you don't need to do it anymore. I think basically the, and also, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, stack checks at runtime. I think a lot of the, the small op codes, uh, dupe swap at or whatever, uh, should come down by one or two gas. Okay. Um, so for, Large scale gas changes. I know we're going to have a lot of large scale gas changes in um, vertical. So I'm hesitant to do anything before then, um, since we're going to be blowing up the world in vertical anyway, at least for the storage operations. Um, Paul has his hand up. Yeah, I, I have some comments about it. So, first of all, this jump this analysis that showed up in Solidity benchmarks, uh, I think this is not really accurate to to like regular client. So mostly the issue is that we don't have any caching for this or any maintenance in EVM1 as the testing tool. So it just like performs the 
the drum death analysis first time I seized the code and that repeated over and over in the loop if you benchmark this somehow. So that's why <clears throat> it kind of screwed the, the result. So we, in the end, disabled this as well for legacy. So I think it's like more comparable. Uh, I know that the uh, like full client implementation, like they, they need to carefully handle this <clears throat> separately. And I think doesn't this this number doesn't reflect the the full client in this way. Um, yeah, but definitely you don't have to do it for your F. Uh, but it's hard to tell like how much um how much performance you get from this. Um, like for Aragon, I I currently try to rework code for that, and the jump this analysis is like almost zero percent of overall execution time because it's just cached by. Yeah, that's like for like five, five, five thousand recently used accounts, and it's kind of it's kind of close to zero. Um, so yeah, so mostly we just disable that to have more comparable results. Um, secondly, I think the gas the gas drops with EOF, com the solidity compiled to EOF, but also the the execution time drops more or less comparable amount. So I think this actually, this, it means the gas is actually accurate before and after. Um, that's that second comment. And uh, anything else? Maybe that's, that's, that was all I want to say. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, like part of the, draw of EOF is like, we don't have to do a lot of the analysis at runtime, like pop and knob, right? Jump test. Like, oh yeah, that's yeah. one more thing. Um, so really we actually, anything. yeah, in EVM one, we don't actually disable uh, stack checks yet. And I think it's unlikely that we'll disable these for, for EOF release. It's like, it's it's change that gives you like maybe five, maybe 10%. Uh, but we didn't, We I think we will limit the number of refactoring we do to the EVM. Um, I think partly because EOF was in EVM one for like two years and yeah, I, I think at this point it doesn't really make sense to kind of write it again. Uh, uh, probably some some time later, yeah, definitely. But I think it's it's a bit too risky to do it right now. Um, so yeah, I I I also think we can revisit like many gas schedules. But I, I kind of see it that this is, this is probably something to do later than in the same time we, ship EOF. I think uh, in a theoretical future where there's like native compilation, uh, uh, the calculus is all different. So gas is not just a direct measure of time spent computing. It's also, I mean, we get to the multidimensional gas. Sometimes it's used to pay for storage long-term. Um, it's also gonna be used um, in Verkle to pay for data that you add to the witness, not necessarily computation time. Um, so that's, you know, one argument against using strict computation time against it as a guide. But again, bringing up Verkel, we're blowing up the gas schedule there. If we do that, that would be a better place to do it than in Prague. Okay. Yeah, I just thought it should be kind of revisited. Okay, any other comments? All right, I'll give everyone 11 minutes back. Thank you for calling in today. We're getting some great progress done. Thank Congrats you. on including UF side prog. Yep. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone.